Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Song of Solomon. Um, we are reading the Old Testament together. We're doing the Bible together. And this book is um, next up on the docket. That's not why. Well, it kind of is why. I read it a few days ago and just could not shake it. I, I saw something, but I couldn't tell what it was I was seeing. I was overwhelmed by, if you're reading it or you have or will read it, in one of the modern versions, whoo, <laughs> Wow. You know, usually I am most comfortable anymore wearing jeans here on Sundays, but I felt that that just would not show enough respect to this book. I just it wasn't sure if I was dressed well enough for the book of the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, whichever your Bible calls it. And I don't mean that your Bible's different in the text, but the English is sometimes translated differently. This book is hot. <laughs> It, uh, whew, whew, it, it says things. It gets the gold medal for saying things without saying it. They say that there are movies that are the best scare movies when you don't really see the monster or it, it makes you afraid without you knowing. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like I'm not a movie person. So I, I, everybody wants, lots of people want to move to Texas, but that guy has the chainsaw out there. And I've never understood why everybody wants to go there with that guy running around with a chainsaw cutting everybody up. And that kind of movie tries to scare you just by the, the visual, I guess. I've never seen them, but blood and gore. But there are other movies, and, and I guess there are movies that are like that, maybe books, I don't know. But I can tell you this. This book, wow, <laughs> the Jewish people, there was a season in Israel when you weren't allowed to have this book read to you unless you were 30 years old. Come on. If you question the God we serve, if he isn't interested in every aspect of our lives, just check this book out in one of the modern English translations. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, read it a second time and read it all the way through. It's only eight chapters. You can get there. It's, it's just, boom, 20, 35 minutes, and you've read it. Um, and then don't probably just walk away and say, Ooh, wow, <laughs> what is that? So there are a lot of debates as to what was being taught here. What, what's the principle? What, what's... And there's a camp that says this is a picture of how God intends for his people to enjoy marriage. And that's probably a given. There's another camp, or maybe some of the same people, I don't know. But they believe it's a, it's a prophetic story about Israel and, and God, the God of Israel, and how he loves Israel, no doubt. And then there's also, for us as New Testament believers, there is absolutely no doubt that there is at least a foreshadowing, in other words, a pointing forward to our relationship with the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at some of that today. Um, most times when you read it, one of the things that the New Living does is it, it highlights this group of people. They are called the Women of Jerusalem. And the King James doesn't do it, and you don't always see it in the King James the way you do here. And I think, I think these modern translations have done a pretty good job with that. There's no doubt 
that there is somebody else speaking at times. Some Bible translators, people who study the word for a living, some of them believe that the, the man, the husband, or the one being pursued by the young lady is two different men that she's going to be or is engaged to and will be married to a shepherd, a young shepherd from her home area, and that King Solomon has seen her and is trying to win her love and affection. But there are others who believe that the shepherd and Solomon are one of the same. I tend to believe that. I lean that way myself. All right? There are many who believe that you can see aspects of Jesus in him, and I think you, if you read it, you would agree with that. But we're going to look at those women today and what they say, and I want you to ask yourself, who do they represent? Okay? So at the end of this, we had such a, a beautiful time around this altar last week, and Monday, Tuesday, as I was walking, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever it was, I just felt like the Lord encouraging us to stay in that for a while, to stay in that thing where you can, you can come connect with the Lord at an altar without it being too, um, too relational. Uh, like there aren't going to be five or seven people draped over you, praying with you, crying, holding your hand. If you want us to, we will. But in this pandemic, it just feels better, doesn't it, to just kind of walk in and say, Lord, touch me. Well, at the end of this, we're going to give you that same opportunity, okay? Uh, Song of Songs is what the New Living calls it. Go to chapter 1 and look at verse 4. We're really just going to take up the second half of this. In the New Living, I'll read the whole verse, but if you have the New Living translation or one like it, you'll see that it says, the young women of Jerusalem. Now, those titles of who's speaking are not in the Hebrew original language. They have been put there to help clarify. Again, not everyone agrees on who's speaking at what point, but for the most part, there's agreement. All right. So verse 4, take me with you, come, let's run. The king has brought me into his bedroom. So of course, she's told you what happened, and now there's going to be like a a revisiting of how we got to this point. And so now the New Living says, this is the young women of Jerusalem that say this, how happy we are for you, O king. We praise your love even more than wine. The King James says, we remember your love even more than wine. And that is the more correct interpretation. But the emphasis on remembering is that they remember and have a reaction. It's not just remembering, but that remembrance brings a reaction. And so the new living, you see how translation can sometimes take a different word? Because that word helps you to understand what the meaning is. The meaning is, we understand your love, Lord. We are so captivated by your love that it exceeds the love of anything else, and we praise you for that. So let's let's understand from the very beginning here that these women have established their authority based on their love for the king. Would you agree? All right, so this is what it says. How happy we are for you, O king, and we praise your love even more than wine. Or you could say his name, who he is, what he does. Now, I told you the Jewish people were forbidden from having hearing this read or reading it. Most of them did not have their own copy, but until they were 30 years old, Because the language here, the description of what's taking place is very, very graphic. And I'm not comfortable talking that way, all right? Just, I'm not. I can talk about anything, especially in the pulpit, but this this is even too hot for me to handle. (laughs) But it's incredible how it describes marriage how it describes the pursuit, how it describes the relationship. But there is another aspect here that you and I need to make sure that we don't overlook, and that is that there's something that God is using to describe or to help us describe our relationship with him or our pursuit of him. 
We often talk about how he pursues us, and that's true, or how we pursue him, and that's true. But it's both. It's not one to the exclusion of the other. He doesn't want, I, I don't see in Scripture where he wants to pursue people who don't want to pursue him back. And I can tell you, I don't know if I can speak for you, but I don't want to pursue him if he isn't going to pursue me back. I just don't. Now, a couple other things I want to mention to you. The, the Jewish scribes, these three books of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, they, they describe them this way. Proverbs, if you want to think about it, is something like the outer court of the temple that Solomon built. Everyone's welcome. In Proverbs, everyone comes. Everyone benefits. Everyone understands. Everyone gets wisdom. Ecclesiastes is the inner court. If you want to go there with God, you've got to determine that you're a priest, that Jesus Christ has saved you, washed you in his blood, made you altogether righteous, and you're going into that place because you want something more from God. And if you want to go into the holy of holies, that's Song of Songs. And you have to determine that you want everything God has. Now this book, <clears throat> Song of Songs, I, I don't know if it's the Catholics or who, but somebody else has called it canticles. And uh, that has to do with the, I think it's Latin for song. But it was considered to be the greatest song ever written. Like Holy of Holies. The holiest place, right? Song of Songs. There's nothing else like it. And if you read it, I don't know <clears throat> what you can find out there in literature uh, that's anything like it. It is amazing. It's almost unbelievably sexual, but even more, it uses those words and descriptions spiritually. All right, so the young women. We're going to follow them through. We're going to move pretty, pretty fast today, okay? We've got seven sayings that they speak. Let's take a look at them real quick. Chapter 2 and look at verse 15. We're talking today about the seven directives in the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. Chapter 2, verse 15. The young women of Jerusalem catch all the foxes. This is the first thing they say to the couple. Catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grapevines are blossoming. Each of my points will start with the letter D. Number one today You've got to discern the flesh and be delivered. We quote this all the time. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. That's the King James. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. But look at what the vine, he's talking about the vineyard of what? Love. It's all those entanglements. It's all those entrapments. It's all those addictions that when you try to bring that into your love life, even if you intend to keep them hidden or forgotten or unvisited, I can tell you that when you come into this place, I don't mean this church, but when you come into a relationship like Solomon is describing, it's that stuff that's going to ruin your love. So what does he say? Too bad for you, so sad, and there's no help? No, look at what these women say. These women say, this is the first thing that we, the first thing we read of them that they declare. Now, we understand they have focused their praise and worship on the king. Right? So that wasn't really, I, I know it was a saying, but they weren't talking to us. They were talking to him. And so I believe that's an establishment of their authority. No matter what happens, 24-7, we praise him. No matter what's going on in the world, we praise him. So these ladies have established where they're coming from. Now the first thing they say to the couple is, you've got to discern what's going on in your life. If you don't discern it and be delivered, catch those foxes. Don't say let them run wild. Listen, you know what they can do. You know the destruction they're intent on bringing, bringing into your life, into your marriage. Catch them. Catch them now before they ruin the vineyard of love. Well, what do I do with them? Well, Samson told you one thing you can do with them. Set your tails on fire. Amen? Well, how do we do that? Well, listen, we know about fire. The fire of the Lord, right? The fire of the Holy Spirit. So there are steps that we can take. We're not going to go into all that today. But you have to know that the very first thing that comes to us, that's imparted to us as we begin to pursue the king is deal with what's there. Not what's over there, what's there. Right? I got to deal with it. 
Listen, it might be a lifetime of dealing with it. You think, well, if I just had enough money. I saw a headline yesterday where people who have uh, more money live longer. Really? I haven't seen that in my experience of watching people, and I'm not sure who's determined to live to be 140 or 180. Why? Why, why would you want to do that? Right? All right, here's the second thing. Look at chapter 3, verse 6. The young women of Jerusalem again. Who is this sweeping in from the wilderness like a cloud of smoke? Who is it fragrant with myrrh and frankincense and every kind of spice? Look, it is Solomon's carriage surrounded by 60 heroic men, the best of Israel's soldiers. They are all skilled swordsmen, experienced warriors. Each wears a sword on his thigh, ready to defend the king against an attack in the night. King Solomon's carriage is built of wood imported from Lebanon. Its posts are silver, its canopy gold, its cushions purple. It's decorated with the love by the young women of Jerusalem. Number two, discover who he is. Discover who the king is. I love how they start that. Who is this sweeping in like a Mist in the middle of the night, a cloud in the sunny day. Who is this? You and I have the privilege of discovering who Jesus Christ is, to know him. They knew it was King Solomon, but look how they begin to describe him. They say, who is this sweeping in? Who is it fragrant with myrrh and frankincense? It's Solomon. He's surrounded by, by warriors. He's got those who defend him at all times, but then comes down to the close. They've described the, the carriage and how the carriage that he's in or the chariot has canopy of gold and posts of silver. Solomon loved that description always. You'll see that again and again in his writings. In Proverbs, you see it, things about gold and silver, gold and silver. To him, that was just the epitome of, of luxury. And then this is what they say as this um, declaration closes out. It's decorated with love by the young women of Jerusalem. Something, they, they're able to do something with, with that which is unseen. I, how, how is this possible? Pastor, I, I just don't even understand this. This doesn't, I, I didn't see anything. I'm reading this, but nothing speaks to me. I don't, listen, watch this. I think something is going to speak to you in a powerful way. Number one, discern the flesh and be delivered. Entanglements are intended to hinder your love for him and if you're married, your spouse. Number two, discover who he is because he will arrive for you someday. I know, Pastor, when the trumpet sounds. If you go before the trumpet sounds, he will still arrive for you. I've been there when people were dying and said, I see Jesus. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they, they knew somebody that had had that experience as well. I think somebody from here at this church, and I've seen him. I've seen him sit right up in bed and say, here he comes. Glory to God. That's why we live the way we do. That's why we're in love with him. That's why we serve him. That's why we're committed to him. Because we know that even if the greatest and the wealthiest come up with another five years for us to live, and instead of 80, we die at 85, or 90 instead of 95. Listen, I'm telling you that it doesn't matter. It's appointed unto man wants to die. But when you and I are about to depart, the king of glory is coming for us. The king of kings is returning for us. We've got to be watching for him at all times because he's watching for us. I said Wednesday night, there are two groups of people listening for the trumpet, you and I on this side, but the other side's listening for the trumpet as well. Amen. Our loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord, they're listening for the trumpet also. Go now to chapter 5 and look at verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1, the second half or B. And in the New Living, again, there's a separation there. The young women of Jerusalem, O lover and beloved, Eat and drink, yes, drink deeply of your love. Number three, deepen the relationship at all times. A marriage to him is most desirable and to be sought. What, what else is there to seek in life? 
Well, Pastor, you just don't understand what's out there. You don't know. No, no, I'm asking you, what does it promise you? What, what um, Jeff Bezos, right? He, he was divorced a few years ago, and she got how many billion dollars? How much did he pay her to leave? It was a lot, 80? And now she's trying to give it all away. And he's making billions more and got the next woman with him, and we'll see how, how quick... <laughs> how quick her time in the spotlight ends. If you have all the money in the world, what are you going to do? He flew up in the air the other day for 11 minutes. Come on, we're talking about the king of glory. We're talking about the one who gives us eternal life, who's got things for us that we can't even imagine. There aren't words to describe it. We don't know how glorious it's going to be. We've got little bits and pieces, and the Holy Spirit in us is a down payment, just one-tenth of one one-hundredth of one one-millionth percent of what's waiting for us. God doesn't make a 10% down payment, gang. He makes a tiny, tiny, tiny down payment and says, listen, that's going to overwhelm you. You think that's something. Where do you see what I got for you? That's what we have access to. And the women of Jerusalem say, come on, just fall in love with him. Deepen that love with him because you're going to face things. You're going to look at things. You're going to stare things down that are bigger than you, badder than you, and going to scare you. But as long as you're looking past that thing to the love of Jesus Christ, when you're deepening that love, suddenly that, that big monster will begin to fade and you'll realize that you've got everything you need in him. Here's the fourth thing. Chapter 5, look at verse 9. Chapter 5 and verse 9. I love this one. Young women of Jerusalem, why is your love better than all others? A woman of rare beauty. What makes your lover so special? that we must promise this. Here's what she says in verse 8. Make this promise, O women of Jerusalem. If you find him, tell him, I am weak with love. Are you beginning to see who they might represent? Do you think they kind of give us a sense of how the Holy Spirit works? Do you think maybe that they're, they're indicative of his moving among us, hovering, brooding with us, abiding with us, and always pointing us to Jesus Christ. These, these young women of Jerusalem know this young lady, and she said to them, listen, I'm searching for him. I don't know where he's at. Promise me if you find my Lord. See, you and I go to the Holy Spirit and we say, will you show us Jesus? Will you give us an understanding of Jesus? Will you help us to know Jesus? Because Jesus said, when he comes, he will testify of the latest beer on tap. I go to these restaurants and they have to have a bigger chalkboard this week than they had last week because they got to add more flavors. I'm like, it's beer. How many million flavors can there be? But no, this is the greatest one. You, ha you just haven't lived till you've tasted this. Really? I'm doing okay. I had a pretty long walk this morning. I'm living fine, and I didn't taste it. But if you want to convince me, go ahead and try. Here's the, here's the fourth thing. Declare how special he is. You've got to testify Look at what they say. Why? Come on. Come on. Somebody testify. Why is Jesus Christ better than all others? We've lost this in the church. We think he's just as good as all the others. We think he might be in comparison to all the others. But the Holy Spirit will say to you, come on, testify. Remember, we used to have those nights, testimony night, when the people of God would jump up and say, I can't tell you how good Jesus is. I can't tell you how glorious he is, how beautiful he is. But we look at our phone and say, I don't know if Jesus is quite that good or not. I hope he is, but I'm not sure. We look at all the bright lights around us and the people with billions of dollars, and we say, boy, I, don't, I can't imagine how heaven could be this good. I see them building $500 million houses. And, and you think, well, how in the world can you spend $500 million on a house and 10 acres, but they find a way to do it? And then the believers begin to say, well, I'm not sure. 
if Jesus, you know, I think he was a good teacher. I think he had great parables. He did some good stuff in, in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm pretty sure he lived, and, and, but I, I don't get all this why, why some people get carried away. I'm just not a person that really gets carried away. I don't get too excited, and I don't like my emotions to be out there and for people to see me expressing. I'm, I'm more reserved. I'm kind of in control of my emotions. But the Bible says that you and I need to be able to declare why he's everything to us. But if he hasn't done anything for you, he can't be everything to you. And we've come to a place in the church where we've just slid in to church. We've just begun to take a seat at church and not really at the banquet table. We've not been converted. In the old days when you got converted, that man, everything then was past. Everything now is new. We start over. We're not that anymore. We're now this. And we're going to live this way because Jesus didn't just come in and say, I want you to go to church. I want you to sing songs. He came and said, I don't want you to be addicted anymore. He came and said, I don't want you to be heartbroken. I don't want you to be dis- depressed, overwhelmed, anxiety, taking you down the wrong tra- trail. I want you to know me and I want you to reflect my glory. And when that happened, people said, oh, I wish you knew who I know. We've got to declare his glory. This is, she says, listen, if you find, promise me if you find him, tell him, tell him. You you know, the young lady represents the believer, the person passionate in finding Jesus. And she says, you and I say to the Holy Spirit, we sang it. It's what we were singing. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Because you first loved me. And the Holy Spirit says, what? What? Why is your lover better than all the others? Because he first loved me. then why are you still so worldly? What makes your lover so special? Holy Spirit says to me, what makes your lover so special? I want to hear. Come on. Can you think of one thing? What what can you tell me? If you know him, if you've met him, I want to hear you tell me something about him. I want to hear you declare something that nobody else can declare. I want your testimony. I want to hear it because you're unique. You were made individual. You're not created by evolution. You were created by the God of creation, the king of the universe, and he made you individually special so that you can testify like nobody else can. Glory to God. He did something for me he didn't do for you. He found me when he didn't find you. He knew what I was and loved me anyways. He brought me out of it because that's who he is. His nature is to break chains, to clean me off, and to give me a hope and a bright future. That's the king I serve. I don't know who you serve, but I'm going to testify today. You got to get with me because the next two are going to light you up. You got to declare it. Come on, even in the hard times. See, it, we, we're not told that this woman was just without any problems that she as a matter of fact early on she'll tell you that she suffered racial persecution early on she'll tell you that her family abused her oh yeah come on read it read the book don't just flip the page and say well I'm reading because we got to check this off and at the same time you're thinking oh man what are they selling on eBay today when you read it, you recognize this lady had, had problems. She's not somebody who can just say, oh, I got all the money in the world, and I'm chasing after this king. As a matter of fact, the way I see it is she doesn't know, or he's not yet king when she knows him. He's a young guy, but then he's away for a while. He goes away. He, he's introduced as a shepherd. There's something about him, but we don't know what it is yet. There's something future that's contained in him, but we can't see it. And all we can know is that Calvary was necessary. And he goes away. And then when he comes back, the women of Jerusalem say, look at this. The shepherd is a king. And she says, 
<laughs> I knew it. I knew it. And then you get those descriptions, and they're going crazy over each other. And wow, are they describing each other. Ooh, you got to close both eyes and one ear. Oh, man, they're describing each other, right? All right, here's the next one. Go to chapter 6, verse 1. You've got to understand who you are in Jesus, or more importantly, you've got to understand who he is. Chapter 6, verse 1, young women of Jerusalem, where has your lover gone, a woman of rare beauty? Which way did he turn so we can help you find him? Where has your lover gone? Number five, determine to find him. Seeking him above all else is always the thing to do. Determine to find him. See, this, I know this is difficult because he's gone. He was here physically. History even acknowledges that he was here on the earth. How many, who would stand today and say, Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh? Thank you. See, he, he did. And nobody historically denies that. They'll try to distort it, but they don't deny that. Even Islam acknowledges that he came to the earth. Hello? But the question is not, where was he? The question is, where is he? right now. And so for the church, we are a mystical organization or organism. We're not, you know, it's not just the bodies, but mystically we have to understand that we can find him even in this life. Though he is not physically here and we are physically here, he is somewhere and we can be there with him. Now, the only way we can be there is to have an out-of-body experience. Glory to God. I'm not talking New Age. I'm not talking about UFOs. I'm talking about having an experience with Jesus that's not limited by your life here, your flesh, your brain, and all of that. I'm talking about finding him. I saw a letter to the editor in our newspaper a few weeks ago, and somebody was asking all of the pastors to start talking about UFOs. I just did. Check, right? If you're keeping score, check. Pastor at Central talked about UFOs. When a spirit-filled, spirit-filled Pentecostal, praying in the spirit, singing in the spirit, walking with Jesus believer, tells me that they've met somebody from a UFO, <laughs> I still won't. <laughs> still won't care. <laughs> But it's never happened, it's not going to happen. So that's really my statement. You can read into it what you want. It's an, we have, it's an important paper. When you have a newspaper that, and I know a letter to the editor is just a letter to the editor, but I thought that was critically important. With everything going on in the world, it's, it, I need having about 30 every year less minutes. Uh, the church culture permits fewer and fewer minutes for preaching. So my time, and, and I need to spend some of that time talking about UFOs. Ooh. Determined to find him. Look at number uh, 6, verse 13 of chapter 6. Return, return to us, O maid of Shulam. Come back, come back, that we may see you again. Hmm, that's interesting. If you look, <clears throat> well, do I want to back up here? Verse 12, before I realized it, my strong desires had taken me to the chariot of a noble man. Now, what you don't know here is the exact translation. And so you can find out in the New Living that they're not exactly sure what the Hebrew meant there. But she's crying out. Something has taken me. And the Holy Spirit cries out, return, return, come back, that we may see you again. I love that. While the church is gone to be with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit continues to do his work here, for seven years he cries out, come back, church. And there is a day 
I said there's a day at the close of the tribulation when the bride and the groom say, we're coming back. It all belongs to him. We're coming back. Now he goes on. The verse continues in 13. The young man now is speaking. Why do you stare at this young woman of Shulam as she moves so gracefully between two lines of dancers? And, and it's, the question here, is she moving between dancers or is she dancing between two armies? But the imagery, you can, it, everybody agrees that what the Holy Spirit is describing or what the young women are describing is that this young lady is worshiping or celebrating with dance that she's so engaged with her husband, with this lover of hers, that she's now dancing. Number six this morning, and you got to hear this one, dance and celebrate with him. We're not going to be returning from being with him until the celebration in heaven is over. The Lord himself descends with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. We which, those who are dead and the Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain going to be caught up together and we'll be with him. And everybody's saying, yeah, oh, and we're going to dance. Oh, I sing that song. Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? What, you're waiting till then to dance? Why? Why? Why does everybody want to wait and be Pentecostal once they get to heaven? I never understand that. And the Holy Spirit calls us to be Pentecostal now. It, Paul said in Corinthians, tongues will cease. Revelations will end. You and I have this opportunity now, not then. The celebration that we do by faith is now. You cannot do it by faith in his sight. You don't get any credit for it. It's not worship and praise like it is now. When the king of glory sees you and I in the midst of what we're going through, in difficulties, in bankruptcies, in divorce, in abandonment, in abuse, when he sees us in the midst of losing everything, our health and our strength, when we are aging and we can't do the things we used to do, when he sees us saying, I want to dance right now Jesus because I know you I know what you've done for me I've served you all these years and you've never let go of me then I begin to say oh glory he said oh that's worship that's worship listen I got 10 zillion angels that can dance but there's no need to dance up here you can see me you're with me the time to dance is now Come on, we've got the opportunity to celebrate now. Come on, we can do it now. Not going to be any opportunity to pray in tongues up there, sing in tongues. You're going to do it now. Come on, the Holy Spirit has that for you now. You can do it now. I'm not singing what will everything be when I get up there. I'm singing I want it right now. I want to worship Jesus now. But pastor, they'll think we're crazy. They'll think we're strange. They'll think that we don't belong in this modern world and we'll be offensive to them. Glory to God. Why do we care what the world thinks? we got to begin to care what the King of Glory thinks. The the Holy Spirit says, come on, come on. Even the, the groom, this is the groom that cries out. And he says to the Holy Spirit, why are you staring at her? And the Holy Spirit would probably cry back and say, because I spent all of this time getting her ready. Why do you stare? Spirit of the living God never takes his eyes off the church. Spirit of the living God never, never divorces himself from the church. He's always working in the church. If you want God, you got to be in the church. I'm not talking about the building. I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm not even talking about this local assembly. I'm talking about being in the blood-bought church. And as long as you're in the blood-bought church, the Holy Spirit's always watching you, always. He's always got your back, your front, your left, and your right. He's always got above you and below you. He's always got you because you belong to the one that he's promised you to. And he's not going to let you go sideways. He's not going to lose grip on you. He's not going to let you go your own way. He's got you, and he always will. Here's the seventh and last thing this morning. Look at, look at chapter 8, verse 5. Haven't I done a great job singing this morning? I'm, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> Such a said, <pam>, beautiful. <laughs> uh, 8 and 5, the things I do to pull you in. <laughs> The young women of Jerusalem, who is this? 
sweeping in from the desert, leaning on her lover. The Holy Spirit says the first time, who is he sweeping in from the desert to grab his bride? And now the Holy Spirit says, who is she? Paul says about the Antichrist, he will be destroyed at the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians, I believe that is. At the brightness of his coming, everything, the billions or trillions, the politicians, the lavish buildings, the vehicles, the brightness of his coming will empty out every unclean river. It will eliminate every trash dump. At the brightness of his coming, everything that the enemy has been doing for 6,000 years will be destroyed at the brightness of his coming. And the Holy Spirit says, I don't care about any of that. I'm not out there looking around saying, oh no, that was an iPhone 12. Oh, The Holy Spirit says, who is she? Who is she sweeping in with him from the desert? Look at this one. I promised her to him and here they come. This has been made ready for you. You can rule and reign here now forever. This planet belongs to you. It never did belong to the enemy. It never belonged to the wealthy. It never belonged to the rebellious. It belonged to you. It's yours. Come now. And he says, the Holy Spirit says, who is this with you? And every person in the church is going to cry, it's me, it's me, it's me. That's why Paul said that you and I should comfort one another with these words. There's nothing comforting here. Nothing. No matter how good your health is today, it is simply not going to be given to you every day. No matter how wonderful your bank account is today, you are just one hospitalization away from having nothing. No matter what you focus on today, it means nothing, and the Holy Spirit didn't even pay attention to any of that. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't want to make you healthy, heal you. God doesn't want to bless you and prosper you. Not at all. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is none of that has anything to do with who you are in Jesus Christ. That might have to do with what you do in Jesus Christ, how you impact others, how you make a way for others. But the Holy Spirit says, come on, keep your attention where it belongs. Keep your focus where it needs to be. Understand who you're engaged to. You can dance for him right now. You can testify about him right now. You don't have to wait. You can testify when you're at work. You can testify at school. You can testify out the fairgrounds. You can testify when people around you are drunk, high, hungover, ready to kill themselves. You can testify at any time. Well, pastor, they won't like it. It doesn't matter if they like it. He will like it. You and I do it for him. He'll love it. The Holy Spirit will say, oh, you go, go, go. Come on, come on, you do it. That's that unction that you've told me about sometimes when you were telling somebody about the goodness of God. That's that anointing when you said to that person, yes, I'll pray for you. Yeah, I know you've mocked me and made fun of my faith for years here at work, but today, because there's crisis and you know I'm, I'm with Jesus, I'll pray for you. And you begin to pray. <laughs> and you hear the Holy Spirit saying, Ooh, Who are you? Come on. Yeah, go, go, go. That's the anointing. Well, Pastor, I, I thought I had to be at church and I thought somebody had to be singing and Sister Pam would be playing the piano. And, and I, I just feel like I blacked out for a minute and I was looking down from above and I could hear myself giving a thunderous message and Elijah would show up and well, it could. But the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say in that moment. The Holy Spirit. Amen? Don't wait to think you're going to be Pentecostal when you get over there. Just like a true Baptist. It's all good when we get there. Come on, thank God for the Baptist. I love you, love you all, you love Jesus, I love you, you're great soul winners, praise God. No problem, no criticism, no offense. But we get to be spirit-filled Pentecostal right now. 
And it wasn't the young ladies that said, you see her dancing? It was him that said that. He said it. He saw it. The picture I love is Isaac walking in the field. And Rebecca says to the, to the steward of the house, Who is he? <laughs> it was an arranged marriage. We were laughing in Pakistan because Pastor Asher, he and his wife, it was an arranged marriage. And the girls asked Sister Mancha, how did, how did you feel about that? And she said, all I could think was, when I meet him, I just hope he has two ears, two eyes, and a nose. <laughs> this was an arranged marriage. Well, all that Rebecca knew was all he offered, wealth. All she knew was what he could do for her. But when she saw him, oh. Hallelujah. My clock went to zero. Bow your heads with me this morning, please, and let's, let's enter in to the Holy of Holies. We've been in the outer court, and Sister Pam and I have tried to take you in to the, to the holy place, but only you. We're not allowed in there with you. Only you can go into the Holy of Holies. Only you can enter in with all that's within you. Only you can fall in love with Jesus and say, Jesus, this is amazing. I, I, I don't even know how to have words for what I feel about you and from you. The idea with the Song of Solomon was that it would give us some words that would help us to understand how passionate it can be. Now listen, God's not looking for fakery. He's not looking for us to make it up, to do it and say everything will be okay, but to really press in and to let him eventually. We were talking about this the other day. Somebody I was talking to, and you're probably here and I forget who it was, but that pursuit, that going after him, going after him, and it eventually being rewarded. Most likely not on day one. Probably not in the first few days but a day when Jesus shows up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning, church, all over this place? called to be spectators as we begin to press in this morning I want to open this altar for you to have your moment with Jesus in the holy of holies I can't tell you what to say or how to say it I can't tell you what to do or how to do it but what I can tell you is that Jesus Christ is more beautiful than anything we can imagine in a way that we can't imagine. But to see that takes our whole being. We have to be brought in by the Holy Spirit. We can't, we can't see this with our eyes. And obviously, as for those of us who are guys, it's difficult because we think of, of loving someone that way, but he's also in gender masculine. And so it can create roadblocks for us, but the Holy Spirit doesn't bring us in in the condition we're in now. He brings us in, in a spiritual atmosphere. He brings us in, in a way that our, our whole being discovers Jesus Christ. As I pray, if you want to say to the Lord Jesus, I want to come in to the Holy of Holies. I have a desperate situation. I have a thing that I'm praying about. I have a situation. I have this or that. 
I have this battle, I have that stronghold, I have this addiction. Whatever you want to say, it doesn't matter. Because as you go through the holy place and into the holy of holies, the, ho the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, what he's doing is bringing you in there prepared. He's bringing you in through the blood. Well, pastor, I don't know if I, if I pray today and, and I ask Jesus to set me free. What if I run back to that thing later today or next week? Listen, don't worry about later today or next week. Would you just come in now? Just come in right now. Trust the blood right now. Well, if I can get better, then I'll trust the blood. The blood says you'll never get better. The blood says trust and I'll make you better. But I feel unworthy. Great. That's the way you're supposed to feel. Well, no, I've disappointed God. Oh, join the club. But today, in spite of your entanglements, if you want to come into the Holy of Holies, this is your moment. I'm opening the altar for anyone whosoever will. Father, as we, as we pursue the Son of God, as we pursue Jesus Christ, the lover of our souls, we do so with love in our hearts. We pursue with everything in us. We dance now, not then. We praise now, not then. We testify now, not then. Because we're going to overcome the enemy by your blood and the word of our testimony. We testify now that Jesus is glorious. We testify now that he's the resurrection and the chain breaker. We testify now that he's the healer. Whether I ever get healed or not, he's the healer. Whether I ever get a, a blessing financially or not, he's the prosperity. Whether I'm ever brought through or not, he's the fourth man in my fire walking with me and my friends. I love you, Jesus, and I'll never stop.